All right, hopefully that is working. Can you all see me and all that good stuff? Looks good. Looks good, sounds good, hooray. Well, thank you all so much for having me. I think this is about the only way I'm going to visit the United States uh, for the next foreseeable future. Hold on, there we go. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the impacts of Scotch broom on pollinators and pollinator communities. Uh, and this is work I did when I was a postdoc at Simon Fraser University with Dr. Elizabeth Ellie. And of course, now I'm at the University of the Fraser Valley here in BC. All right, so all of you know full well that invasive species threaten biodiversity uh, by replacing diverse native communities and modifying ecosystems in complex ways, like the way that Scotch broom can modify soil chemistry by being a nitrogen fixer. Uh, and by doing this, um, or to, in order to do this, if they're a flowering invasive plant like Scotch broom, they face a little bit of a challenge because they need to get pollinated, right? And in order to um, set seed, they have to either bring their own pollinators along, and these are so-called invasive partnerships that we see in some places of the world between non-native plants and non-native bees kind of coming in and having this sort of invasive mutualism. Um, the other thing that an invasive plant can do is co-opt the local community of native pollinators to act uh, as its own pollinators. And of course, in the case of purple loosestrife, native bees are perfectly happy to visit and pollinate the abundant flowers of this plant. Right, and so from the perspective of a bee, food is food, right? So it doesn't matter if it's an invasive plant, if it's a, a nice, ornamental plant in your garden, or if it's a native plant, that's a resource that it can use. And in the case of invasives, if they form these sort of large monocultures, they provide abundant resources when they are in bloom. Um, but because they reduce native diversity, they can affect that the quality of resources that are present, their pollen may not be as nutritious as native plants. And they also, more importantly, I think, affect the continuity of resources. So if you have a, a monoculture of scotch broom in that brief period when broom is flowering, there is a bonanza of food for certain types of bees, but as soon as that's done, there's nothing. And when you have a diverse native plant community, you'll have early flowering plants, late flowering plants kind of overlapping with each other over time, creating a, a sort of continuity um, of resources over the season of flowering. Now, scotch broom is a little bit of a weirdo in the land of flowering invasive plants. Uh, the sort of the typical idea is if you're going to be an invasive flowering plant, you should be able to be visited by many different types of bees, allowing you to co-op those native bees uh, to act as your pollinators. And, and scotch broom is a little weird. Its floral morphology actually restricts effective pollinators to large-bodied bees such as bumblebees and honeybees. And you see my little diagram here. I have a tripped and an untripped flower, and a large-bodied bee has to land on that um, flower and depress the the, the keel so that the anthers and the stigma pop out and they can get at the pollen. And the, the bees that really do this effectively are large bodied bees such as bumblebees and honeybees. And so we might expect the way that Scotch broom interacts with this sort of broad diversity of native pollinators to be a bit different uh, from a plant like purple loosestrife that can be visited by just about anything. Right, so my research when I've worked on Scotch broom kind of looks at some, some general questions of how about how broom impacts pollinator communities and thus plant communities, right? So broom might impact bees by providing food to some pollinators but not others, uh, by changing the structure of plant pollinator interactions, so affecting who is present uh, and in what numbers, and then what kinds of other plants are getting visited, sort of having knock-on effects of the on the pollination of native plants that are remaining, right? And then Via these impacts, they can then affect the remaining native plants. Of course, they affect native plants directly via competition and allelopathy and all of that stuff, but they might also be affecting them indirectly by these changes in the pollinator community. Okay. So my research uh, focuses on the oak savanna or what we call uh, um, the Gary Oaks up here in British Columbia. So this is in Southern BC on Vancouver Island. Uh, these communities, uh, they're a highly diverse plant and pollinator community. Hundreds and hundreds of different bee species live in this habitat and take advantage of these beautiful spring ephemeral flowers. And 
invasive species play a rather important role in disrupting these communities and taking a beautiful habitat like the one above and converting it into here's our um we have a talk about broom here's a student trapped in a broom forest picture as we must have uh, converting sort of this diverse community into a monoculture of broom and so we studied scotch broom by looking at 18 different sites in the greater victoria area these sites varied in the degree or the intensity of broom invasion mostly due to the degree of effort being put forward by volunteers to remove that broom. So our low broom sites are not magically lacking in broom. People put in effort to maintain their sort of the broom free state. Uh, we studied them over two field seasons. And what we did is we collected the pollinator community by netting uh, six or more times over the summer. And so you go out with a net uh, and you collect every single bee that you see and you wind up with these links between the bee and the plant, uh, both with broom and with this sort of broader uh, community of uh, native plants that are also there. And then for those that were foraging on broom and some native plants, we also looked at the types of pollen that were, they were using for food. And then we also went out and measured the plant community independently. And I'm just gonna talk briefly about three different questions that we asked with this data. Uh, we looked at the types of bees that are present at these sites. So is broom affecting the sorts of bees that can, can be maintained at, at different locations? And what kinds of resources are those bees using for food? And then we also took that data from all of that netting to look at the structure of plant pollinator interactions. All right, so here's a little bit of data. One thing we tried to examine is, is were bees bigger at broom invaded sites. You might expect them to be bigger because only big bees can effectively forage on broom. And that is indeed what we found is that as broom density increases across our sites, the average mass of the insect, the flower visiting insect uh, became larger, right? So, and this suggests that broom is indeed filtering or limiting the types of pollinators that can use resources at a particular location. If you're a teeny tiny little, Micro, micro bees, tiny little bees, um, you simply can't get resources from scotch broom. So as it displaces uh, the native plants that those bees might use, you wind up with only the big bees left. And then we wanted to see as scotch broom becomes more common, how does that affect the types of pollen that bees were collecting? And you can do this in a really cool way. You can take pollen and you can stain it and look at it under the microscope and pollen from different plants is very distinct morphology. So two of the native plants we studied, uh, the two camas species on the left, um, have this sort of D-shaped pollen. And then scotch broom is really distinct with this, this triangular-shaped pollen with the three clear dots. So we could take pollen from the bees, from their bodies, and look at it under the microscope and say, oh, how much scotch broom pollen is this bee collecting versus uh, native plant pollen? Uh, and we compared this across different bee species of different body sizes. And so on the, on the x-axis, we've got broom density again, so increasing broom density. And on the y-axis, we have the ratio of broom to native plant pollen. Uh, so the higher you go, the more broom pollen those bees were collecting. And we have one species, particularly Bombus melanopygus, that really will take advantage of broom as it becomes more common. So even when we collect that bee on the native plants, it's kind of visiting the native and taking advantage of the scotch broom as well. Our other two bumblebee species and honeybees as well were much less likely to be um, sort of dabbling and foraging on broom as well as native plants. Okay. And so those bees were all caught on the native plant and some of them were also using broom. Bees that were caught on broom um, really tended to be specializing on broom specifically, right? So particularly in the middle, there's Bombus melanopygus, which was the, the bee we saw in broom the most, and very little mixed pollen bees that we saw on broom regularly were specializing on foraging on those sort of slightly tricky flowers. So what does this all mean? Uh, well, I, I think it's pretty clear evidence that broom invasion filters the types of bees that are using that particular site to forage. Large-bodied bees become more prevalent as smaller bodied bees become restricted from using that location. Uh, and the largest bees are the most likely, so Bombus melanopygus being the largest bodied bee that we studied, are more likely to forage on broom even when they're also using native plants as a resource. And 
unlike in places where honeybees and scotch broom have that sort of invasive mutualism partnership, such as in Australia, at least in our particular location in Victoria, during this time of year, honeybees were not major visitors to broom. Okay, getting on to that, that third question, uh, how does scotch broom affect the structure of plant-pollinator interactions? This requires getting maybe a little bit uh, ecology nerdy on you guys. I'm not going to go too much into this, but um, when we study plant-pollinator interactions, one of the things we look at, at are these things called networks, uh, and they let us understand the structure of plant-pollinator interactions by thinking about the plants, the bees, and their interactions simultaneously. You can summarize them in these sort of slightly useless diagrams um, where you have the plants on the bottom that I've, I've put in the green box and you have the bees on the top and these gray bars represent links between plants and bees and the thicker the bar is the more frequently we see that bee visiting that particular plant and I have these two different networks up here for you and just to show you that's scotch broom right so the network on the top is a location that is not very invaded by scotch broom. And the one on the bottom is our, I think our most highly invaded network. Uh, and we can just kind of see from the patterns and the, the number of bars that there's a strong impact on plant diversity. There's also a strong impact on bee diversity uh, and some more tricky impacts on the way that those bees and plants are interacting. All right, so what can we measure with this data? Uh, we can look at the, how many types of plants and bees there are, um, we can look at how specialized bees and plants are. Do, does a bee mostly visit one plant or is it visiting many different types of plants? And does that change uh, as a network becomes more invaded? And then lastly, we can look at how stable the network is. Uh, so if you remove a plant, how many bees does it impact? And if you remove a bee, how many plants are affected? I have a cat, buddy, and thank you. Um, Okay, and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the math. I just want to kind of give you guys a summary of what we found out. Uh, and what we found is that as, as broom invasion increases, you see a decrease in diversity of both plants, shocker, uh, and bees, which supports this idea that broom is filtering out certain pollinator species. Um, more invaded communities have a lower abundance of visiting insects as well. So the, 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 the insects are bigger, but there are fewer of them, you know, the ones that are remaining. These networks are also less specialized, which means that the, the insects that are remaining are generalists that are visiting many different types of plants, right? So the uninvaded network, you see more specialists, and in the invaded network, you see more generalist bee species, right? Lastly, these networks are less robust to the loss of plant species. So, in an uninvaded network, if, if a plant species disappears, uh, there are a few impacts on the bee species. Maybe you lose one or two. In an invaded network, like the, the one on the right, uh, if you lose another plant species of ones that are left, there are impacts on many different bee species and the potential for more sort of snowballing effects. Okay. So just to kind of interpret this, uh, some of these impacts, I think, are, are a little bit intuitive and, uh, you know, network's kind of nerdy, but um, unsurprisingly, right, broom invasion reduces the diversity and abundance of native pollinators. Um, and as broom, and this makes sense, as broom displaces native plants, it reduces the, the variety of resources available for native pollinators. It likely, it likely affects the continuity of resources over time. And of course, it acts as a filter providing resources to some types of bees and not to others. But I think it's interesting maybe to ask why broom invasion might reduce specialization because the, the structure of the broom flower suggests that the bees that use it should be specializing. But, but the, the big body bees that are capable of doing that are bumblebees and honeybees. These are, by their biology, they're generalist pollinators uh, that when they're present at a site, we'll take advantage of all the different plants that are present. And within pollination, um, specialists um, tend to be small, they tend to be less common, and they're the sort of thing that you would likely see excluded from a location uh, that has been invaded by scotch broom. Okay. So just to kind of summarize things, and uh, you know, I'm ahead of schedule, which is, which is not so bad. Uh, we do see that increasing invasion uh, in parks in Victoria changes the types of bees that are present. 
right? Larger bodied bees are dominating communities at invaded sites. Uh, and those bees are making use of both native and scotch broom plants, though those that are foraging on scotch broom tend to specialize on it, right? And in our location, bumblebees are really the major visitors of broom, right? So this is a, a case, at least in, in our part of the world, where scotch broom has co-opted native pollinators that are basically equivalent to the things that were pollinating it in its native range. Bumblebees are really flexible uh, foragers that can learn to get resources from just about anything. Uh, and in this case, they're quite happy to take advantage of scotch broom. Right, and so the second sort of general question was, does increasing broom invasion change the structure of plant pollinator interactions? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, unsurprisingly, broom has large impacts on plant pollinator communities. A lot of this is driven by the way that broom changes the composition of the plant community, but also via the way that broom changes the sorts of bees that can remain at the site. Right, so we have a reduction in the diversity and the abundance of pollinators and impacts on the specialization of the network. And then of course, we have networks that are now more vulnerable to further loss of other species, right? So, so broom invasion doesn't just displace native plants, right? It changes the types of pollinators that are present, um, reduces the abundance and diversity of those pollinators, uh, and this is all likely due to its restrictive flowers combined with its impacts on the abundance of other plants in, in, in the site. Uh, it also affects the structure of the community and it makes the community potentially more vulnerable to further species loss. And, and this is where I think it's something to consider um, as you remove scotch broom, this could be a really disruptive, we call it broom bashing uh, up in Victoria, but this can be a really disruptive process and care should be taken during removal and restoration to maintain the populations of the remaining native plants. If you're concerned with supporting the remaining native pollinators and providing an opportunity for sort of reestablishment of populations of other pollinator species. Okay. And that actually wraps it up. Yeah, I am a few minutes fast. Um, all of this research takes a, a team of students willing to wrestle their way through Scotch Broom fields uh, to collect data. Uh, so thanks to all of them. Uh, this research was funded by an insert grant to my collaborator, Dr. Elizabeth Ellie. And thank you all for listening. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you in person at the next Scotch Broom Symposium. Yes, that would be lovely. Uh, thank you all for having me. <laughs>